Well, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to uh, the University of the West of Scotland, to all, to all our visitors, um, and welcome colleagues as well uh, to, uh, to our event this morning. Um, you're probably not hearing any amplification from this. That's because this is not for this room, it's for the WebEx. So welcome also those who have joined us on the World Wide Web. Um, you're all very welcome uh, on to our Lanarkshire campus um, for this morning's uh, uh, event, which is uh, an opportunity for us to uh, explore uh, um, uh, uh, and deepen a, a partnership, which is, uh, which is just in its beginning and to explore an important topic as well um, that we are, uh, uh, that, that's, that's vital to, uh, to business. Um, none, none more so than after the announcement yesterday of, uh, of Thomas Cook's demise, um, um, when we think about the change required in, uh, uh, or, or that wasn't done uh, in Thomas Cook. Um, so anyway, um, I'm not gonna go into that at the moment. Um, you can all see the, uh, the agenda. Um, I'm, um, we're going to take you through uh, an introduction to UWS. Um, Professor Dominic Elliott is going to do that from our School of Business and Creative Industries. Um, and then Johnny Beamish is going to take over and take us through the whole uh, uh, reflection on change and, uh, and how we might think of that afresh. Uh, and there'll be plenty of opportunities, I think, for us to, to discuss and exchange ideas and, and, and views, which I'm, I'm very much looking forward to. So, so to get started, um, I'd like to introduce Professor Dominic Elliott, who's going to tell you just a little bit about UWS. Dominic. Well, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to welcome you to, to Lanarkshire, University of West of Scotland. I think change is a constant. In fact, as I speak, I think the High Court or the Supreme Court, whatever we call it, is currently making a judgment on the legality of the Prime Minister's prorogation, if that's the correct term, of, of Parliament. So I do wonder by the end of today we might have some momentous, or oh, the end of the hour, a momentous change. One of the things which we seek to do at UWS is to prepare our students to respond to the fact that change is a constant. Perhaps one of the things about change is the speed of change seems to be increasing. And my own research, I've got an interest in how organisations learn or don't learn from crisis. And often crises emerge in organizations because they fail to adapt with the changing environment. Johnny mentioned Thomas Cook, a very sort of current example. And you can imagine how an organization like that with 175 years of history seems to have lost touch with its environment, its marketplace, and current business practice. And as a consequence, 150,000 people are stranded in different parts of the world. UWS, we're spread across some five campuses, across the west of Scotland, four, Air, Lanarkshire, Paisley, and Dumfries. We have a campus in London. It's a large, it's a growing university. Um, we are well regarded in a number of subjects. We're ranked as a young university, as fourth in the UK. We're in the top 500 universities worldwide, and we're ranked first in education in the UK. Crossing borders, one of the things that we try to give our students is an international experience. International experience may be visiting other countries. The most important international experience we can give is by attracting students from around the world to study at our campuses, because that creates a multicultural environment in which our students are exposed to a wide range of different values, different perspectives, and different ways of doing things. Preparing them, if you like, for, the, for future employment. And I think that's... Uh, the biggest impact any university can have is through its graduates into employment. The building that we are in at the moment is, was opened officially about a year ago. It's award-winning for its environmental friendliness. Very much, again, a sort of current topic, listening to Radio 4 this morning. The uh, Greta giving, <laughs> I suppose, us old fogies a bit of a bashing. I didn't get to hear what Donald Trump's response in his tweet was, but I understand it was, it was fairly obnoxious. Our key drivers, excellent teaching and learning, a contemporary, relevant and impact portfolio. Now I'm the father of four children, three of whom have been to university. One of the things I, I like to joke with them about is they're lucky enough to have been born at a time where they could live to be a hundred. There is a downside however, the chances are they're going to have to work until they're 85. Now, part of an education is to encourage learners to become lifelong learners. 
because my children are likely to have two, three, four careers. I think probably our, our parents' generation, you might have one job. You might have one job, work for the same employer for 40 or 50 years. Next generations are probably going to work in jobs that haven't even been invented yet. Part of adapting to change is having people who are in a position where they can respond, where they are curious and where they have the skills to continually almost reinvent themselves. And that's a key part of what we try to do for our students at the UWS. I've talked about the international impact. Challenging and question convention, I think that lifelong learning requires curiosity. Curiosity. That underpins a constant search for different ways of doing, reflecting on the world, reflecting on ourselves. And we seek to apply the research and enterprise that we engage with in the classroom. So I'm a professor of management. While I like to, like to joke that I've got a, an MBA, a first degree, and I've popped in management, I have a younger brother who left school with a CSE grade five in RE. Which one of us do you think runs and owns his own multi-million pound business? I wish I could say it was me. But there's something about practice. And one of the strengths about UWS is that it seeks to give our students access to professionals, to work-based opportunities, because that's where we really change lives. And I think for a large number or percentage of our students, they're the first in their families to go to university and perhaps don't have the same opportunities as some others. So that's a key part, if you like, of UWS's mission and its sort of vision for the world. So the focus on the future, this not only is it eco-friendly, but it is a flexible learning space in which we encourage lecturers to move from the sort of traditional workshop, seminar, lecture, they still have their place of course, but to flip classrooms so that people and students can apply the knowledge within the classroom with one another. So the environment is created to give flexibility to learning. I've talked about the graduate prospects is their future employment um, outcomes. A focus upon professional development, collaborating and forming partnerships, delivering the sort of attributes that are important, not just in the workplace, but in all aspects of, of our students' lives in the, for, in, in the future. And if I could pass over to Johnny now, who is our, I don't know whether director or head of research and enterprise, John will be able to tell you a little bit about the research of the institution. Thanks very much, Johnny. Um, when Dominic mentioned the, uh, the, the applied nature of the research that we do here at UWS, which we're very proud of, you know, you, you're, you, you, everybody knows um, organisations like Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard, and uh, they're all very well known for their research. Um, UWS does have very much a, a focus on the transforming the, the lives of our students, and giving them that experience that will enable them to go out and make a difference in the world. But that can't be done unless it's informed by innovation, by thinking of new ways to do things, uh, uh, informed by very close engagement with our, our key stakeholders in industry. Um, for the university, industry is a, is a wide term. It, it means the public sector, it means the health service, it means the third sector, and it also means commercial industry as well. Um, because, because our students come um, through programs that are are really varied, but what they have in common is really their, uh, their applied sciences. So you, you can't really do uh, sort of medieval Latin poetry here at, uh, at UWS. Not that that's a bad thing to do, but you, you wouldn't be able to do a, a program in that here. Um, because we're focused on uh, uh, helping to develop the next generation of educators and teachers, um, especially in STEM education. Um, we, uh, we help to develop uh, social scientists, especially those who are involved in, in social services and social work. Um, we have a, a big focus on nursing and health. Uh, we produce lots of, lots of nurses and midwives for the health service and for the care sector. Um, we also have a, a broad uh, set of, of capabilities in computing, in engineering, and in physical sciences. Uh, and it's not surprising that both in, 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 in that area and also in the biosciences, we see a lot of the inventions 
that are, are relevant to industry, are, are ways in which we can engage with uh, stakeholders and help them to, to develop new ways of, of doing things, new products and services. Um, uh, there's a few examples here on the, uh, on the list. Um, but you know, an, an example is uh, just yesterday, um, I was down in Southampton at the, uh, uh, the, the National Air Traffic Service. They had a conference and we were presenting on how planes can be equipped with uh, uh, um, machine learning and imaging that will be able to pick up any obstacles that there might be on the, uh, on the runway as they're coming in to land and take off. Uh, right now it's just done by, but visually. So, the, uh, uh, so, so there's, there's new technologies that are apl applicable in lots of different use cases, and that's something that we are keen to be involved in and are very involved in. Um, we, do that with, we do that with partners. Um, it's really important for us to, to not, do, not go it alone. As an example of a few partners up on the, uh, the screen, but, but we have a wide, wide range of partners in all kinds of industries and sectors, and uh, they're really important to UWS. Um, the, the term that's often used in the area that we work is knowledge exchange. Uh, and that's super important for us and for the stakeholders with whom we work, that, that we exchange knowledge, that we, um, uh, the, the sorts of innovations and, uh, and expertise that we may have here can be informed by the experience and expertise of our partners and vice versa. Um, we have, we have a number of different programs that we, that we focus on as we do that with our partners. Um, an important one is the Knowledge Transfer Partnership. Um, my colleague uh, Stuart Mackay is here, and if you want to talk about that program uh, uh, afterwards, then please uh, speak to Stuart, he's got a lot of experience. But, but really, it's a, it's a funded program, um, a government-funded program to help companies do, do R&D, to develop new products, new services, to new processes, new ways of doing things. Um, and it's a very successful program. The businesses that are involved with us um, are, are, are see, see growth in their business as a result of this, um, almost without exception. Um, another program that's really important is our, our professional development program. So my colleague, Janet Black, who's over there, she'll, she'll be happy to talk to you about that as well. Um, because lots of businesses are looking to develop new skills uh, look, look to, are looking to explore how new technologies may impact their business and the, the skill sets that they need. Um, and so it's an important part of what we do to help our stakeholders understand about artificial intelligence or machine learning or, 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 or the things that may, may, may impact their business. Um, a really crucial part of what we do in terms of our, our, our industry engagement is, is a program um, called Graduate Apprenticeships. Um, those businesses in the room will know you already pay a levy for, uh, for apprenticeships and therefore there's a, there's a program where you can send your employees to, uh, to earn while they learn, to, to, to be able to be accredited for the work they do in the workplace um, and to, 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 to have a, a bespoke learning experience um, um, guided by UWS. Um, um, and Peter here will, will talk to you about that later as well. Um, um, we do a number of programs. Uh, Peter leads the business management one. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very successful program. Those students that go through it find it's a, a really important uh, learning opportunity, very different from coming full time to university. And it's a very important program for UWS because it really helps us understand the, uh, uh, what's, what's needed at the coal face, if you like, when it comes to the education requirements of, uh, of our students. Um, just one last thing I would mention um, is, uh, is the whole area of commercialization. So there's, there was a, um, in the previous slide, we, we mentioned NovoSound. We, we do form spin-out companies. So the university itself generates intellectual property and we, we do try and help that find our roots commercially to, uh, uh, to have economic benefit. Um, and so, uh, and that's something which, uh, which we have had some success with recently, um, especially in the area of sensors and imaging. Um, we've developed a new type of ultrasound sensor, which is, uh, uh, which is able to provide MRI quality imaging, which is most unusual. Normally, uh, I don't know if you're, my only experience of ultrasound was when my kids uh, were, were, were going to be born and they were showing me an ultrasound image and trying to point out a head and a leg, which I couldn't make head or tail of. Um, so, so this is a real breakthrough in terms of what we can do with, uh, with ultrasound in, in industry, especially in, in non-destructive testing. So that's one to, one to look out for. 
Okay, um, I mean, I, I would like to leave you simply with the, uh, uh, with the message, if you haven't picked it up already, which is that UWS really believes in partnerships with industry. Um, and the reason we believe is not because, uh, just because we want to be nice, it's, it's our lifeblood. It helps us to be who we need to be. It helps us to serve the communities that we're in, and it helps us to serve our students whose, uh, whose lives we are looking to, uh, to help transform um, so that they can make their contribution in, the, in society and industry. So thank you for being here. Um, we're going to move away from UWS and into the meat of the, uh, of the day, which is, which is really to focus on, on, uh, uh, on change management. Um, and thank you very much to HCL for, uh, uh, for, for, for putting this on, for taking the, the time and the trouble to do this. Uh, it's important to us, and we look forward to developing a, 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 just this type of partnership with them as well. But Johnny, I'm going to pass over to you now and, uh, and maybe let you do more of the HCL introduction part as well. Thanks, Johnny. Thank you. Are we, uh... <coughs> Thank you. Well, I'm very much glad to be here um, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, I live through in Edinburgh, and I, I very rarely get allowed to go past Hart Hill. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to explain this to, to one of our colleagues who's um, up from Exeter. It's probably not a very good way to start with a, a kind of provocation of our, of, of our English cousins. I was trying to explain to trying to explain to Alex that actually the, the difference between Glasgow and Edinburgh is when you go through to Glasgow, you get a very warm welcome. You go through to the west, you get a very warm welcome. When you go through to Edinburgh, your auntie says to you, "You'll have had your tea." So, thank you for welcoming us here. It is great. I mean, it's, I've never been uh, to the campus. Um, Keith has a very good connection here. It's an amazing campus. Um, absolutely fantastic building. So, for me. Um, really really excited to be here because normally in, in guess in our line of work if i'm talking to a group of people it's a group of people who don't really want to hear from me because they know they're going to have to pay for something and i'm you know typically pitching work at you know millions of pounds so by all means if you want to pay for this that is great um but it's actually nice to be in a sort of uh, you know kind of warm reception rather than scowling faces um so thank you from all of us and sorry there are there are three of my colleagues at the back as well um so if you want to stand up and say hi. Please um, annoy these people during the session and after as well. They're, they're part of the panel at the end. But um, they're, they're, uh, this is our Scottish office, effectively. There are, there are four of us up here now. So making the complex simple. I, I'm kind of beginning to regret that as a title because we've got 45 minutes. And in 45 minutes, there's a lot to cover. And again, I, I thank Keith for that. Um, Keith said to me, look, it's, it's going to be OK. It's, it's a nice audience. It's a great place. Just tell a couple of dad jokes, maybe your holiday pictures, a few stories. He didn't tell me there was going to be 45, 50 people in the room, and he certainly didn't tell me that we were going live. So, hello, mum. It, it, it's, uh, it's nice to have that. But we were going to call this, um, is change management dead? Because actually, if you, if you think about the examples that we've just had, and you know the, the Thomas Cook one, a great example of that, you know, change management to a lot of people is actually just doing a bit of training and a bit of communication. And, and my experience over sort of 20 years is that just really doesn't work. You know, if you're trying to implement either a new system or a new way of working, or you're reorganizing your business, the sort of very thought that, do you know what, we can send out a couple of emails and we can do a little bit of training is going to get us through. So in many ways, that is your classic view of change management. You know, it's just training, it's a bit of engagement, we might even do a town hall, right? You know, and a lot of businesses try and get by on that, and then wonder, you know, at the end of the month, why a people aren't using the system, b people are still picking up the phone to maybe you know their colleague in HR and going, can you can you just do that for me? You know, so they they circumvent the rules a little bit. So we were going to call it um, the death of change management, but we're we're, we're going to try and um, take you on a little bit of a journey over the next 45 minutes and uh, make the complex simple. And when I say simple, I ask Keith this. I said, look, give me a heads up in terms of the audience. How simple do I go with this? Um, because some of, the, some of the exercises that I want you to sort of take part in and some of the, the themes, you're probably going to nod and go, well, I kind of get that. But what I'm going to try and do is make it very, very simple and give you enough information and some thoughts that you can make entirely practical once, once you leave today. So probably I should have introduced myself first. There we go. Um, Johnny Beamish, and, and 
and again, Johnny. We're not going to get our names, no, our names mixed up. I saw on the first slide Jonathan. That is my Sunday name. Um, so please don't call me that because it, it means I'm either in trouble with my wife or my mum. So Johnny Beamish. I've been in Scotland now for about 20 years. I started my working career in Standard Life. Um, that's where I first got involved in change management. And on my first business card, I was very excited. It was Jonathan Beamish, change manager. And the very first person I gave it to, I was just oh, delighted. I've got to give my, to give my business card to somebody. And it was in my local restaurant. And they said, oh, have you, have you, got, you, know, have you got your business card, Johnny? And I thought, oh, excited, of course I have. I gave it to him, and he read it. So it was you know, Standard Life Bank. And he goes, change manager, oh, you could help us with our cash then. I'm like, no, it's not that sort of change manager. So I've, I've been involved in, in change management for, as I said, 15, 20 years. Um, I had the pleasure, I'm not sure pleasure is the right word, probably one of the most stressful experiences of my career. Um, in fact, Stephen's here as well. Stephen and I both worked um, in RBS in the middle of the, I guess, the meltdown, probably the biggest financial crisis um, that we have known, and hopefully we don't see it again. But that was probably the most interesting period of change that I've ever seen an organization go through. And I, th I think the word that was used at the time was a corporate heart attack. And sitting as we were, splitting our time between Edinburgh and London, and, and we sat on the trading floor which is their, their GBM business, is in London. And we sat on the, on the trading floor, and on a daily basis, has, any, has anyone seen any of the movies about the, 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 the crash? And you see the security guard come over, and the security guard comes to your desk with a box, and that's your notice period. We saw that on a, on a daily basis. Just the sort of the change that RBS went through was, was visible. You know, and did they manage the change program well? I don't know. I think we like to think we did a great job for customers. I don't know, did they? You know, if you're a customer of RBS, you know, a really, really bad time to be involved with that organization. So very much in the, in the, in the heart of um, a very visible and a very real change. Um, the other thing that I, that I did when I was Accenture as well, which is why I really enjoy the kind of link with, with um, academia as well, is um, I used to run their learning centers. So this is very much at home for me, um, being in a classroom full of, as I said, people who don't want to spend millions of pounds. But um, when, when, I, when I talk about change management and we, and we talk about transformation, I think what's really interesting, I think over the last three years, and probably five, has, there, has anybody heard the term digital? Anybody? Everything's now a digital transformation. We're going digital, which, which kind of makes me laugh for, for two reasons, because we certainly weren't analog before we became digital. Nobody talked about analog transformation. But the, the term digital, I think is what's accelerated change exponentially. Because not every, everybody wants everything instantly. And we were uh, listening to the radio on, on the way through, just the, you know, the examples of you know, banks now with an app that you can cancel your sort of credit card if you lose it, and then reinstate it if you find it. It's, that's what customers want. They want that instant access. They want to be able to do things you know, quickly, at pace, on your phone. You know, no, nobody goes into Hands up who's been into the branch recently in a bank. No, I mean, we don't, you know, we don't go into a bank. But that, that is the digital kind of revolution, if you like. It's all about customer. It's all about instant. And if you think of that as, um, I guess, a change professional or you know, an IT professional, it's incredibly difficult to keep up with that sort of level of pace. So I think in the last three to five years, you know, digital has probably made what we're trying to say, you know, it's made the simple very, very complex. So we live in a world of, of complexity. So what are we going to cover today? Um, hopefully, I'm going to try and show you how to make that complexity a little bit more simple. Um, one of the things that within our team as well is our kind of motto in many ways is, is, is bring change to life. And you'll find on your, your desk there is, um, you should have it, it's like a little persona. And we're going to talk about that in, in some detail, because actually, that's what makes change come to life. It's, it's the ability to sort of connect with you know, the people who are involved in change is, is incredibly important. So hopefully, we'll bring change to life. Um, and we'll have some discussions about what that really means. And um, the team at the back can share their experience as well. So how are we going to do that? Um, I prefer very much, as you'd probably guess, to, to tell stories rather than actually go a, a lot into slides. But we, we do have some content to cover. We're going to talk about um, the change paradox. 
you know, what, what, what does that really mean? Because you know, the pace of change is accelerating. Are we tooled up for that? Are we capable of doing that? Are we capable of managing it? And there's probably a broader philosophical question as human beings. Are we capable of, of living with the amount of change that, that we're faced on a day-to-day on -day basis? That's for another topic. Um, and what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll share a story um, with a, a client, large client of ours over the last year, which you'll all be familiar with. So Volvo, uh, manufacturer of huge um, trucks, cars, spent a lot of time in Gothenburg working with them on quite a lot of these sort of change challenges. And we'll, we'll tell you how, and hopefully that's where you'll understand where the, the simplicity comes from, but also understand the complexity. So I think we've said this before. There is, there is nothing you know, more permanent than change. I think if, if you look at industry now and you ask people, you ask C-level you know, individuals, you know, what is more important, business as usual or change? The answer typically comes back is I don't differentiate between the two because you know, change is business as usual in many organizations right now. And, and that's where the paradox comes in in terms of, well, how do you manage that? Because you used to be able to go, look, it's projects, the change projects, it's transformation, but actually now, change is business, right? You know, it, it's how business um, operates. To help us a little bit, um, well, what I'd like to do, I said I was going to make this very simple, a little bit of an exercise. Some of you have probably done it before. Could I ask everybody to stand up, please? And sorry for those of you on the web, you can stand up in your living room. Um, partner off with someone. Just stand and, and face somebody in front of you. Yep, good. What, what I'd like you to do what I'd like you to do is, is both, both, par both parties change something about your appearance that is very obvious, a big thing, something very, very big. You can take your tie off, you can take your glasses off, something that's very obvious. Okay. You've, do you've, you've done that. So when, when, when you changed the very obvious part. Tell me, was it obvious when you saw that a person changing? Pretty obvious, right? Big change is quite obvious, right? What, what I'd like you to do now is face away from each other. And I want you to change something very, very small. OK. And let, let, let's turn back. Tell me, can you spot the very, very small? Can you spot the small? Yes? OK. What did you change? The button. OK. Obser observant, yeah? So quite difficult, right? Quite difficult to spot the small stuff, yeah? So what, what, thank, you, thank you for participating. Sorry for the folks at home. Um, if you want to take your seats again. And, as I said, this was simple. It, it's a simple exercise to stress a serious point. In fact, there's two points. When, when you change the big stuff, what, what was going on? A tie came off or a jacket came off. It was incredibly obvious, yeah? But when you change the small thing, why, why could you not spot it? Why could you not spot it? Or did, you did, you did well, one button. What, what, what's the difference there? So the big stuff people get, right? When you're changing your organization, you know, there's a new leader, there's a new um, you know, system coming. People get that, right? But actually, at the, at the level of detail, at the level of the persona of the individual, it's the small stuff that actually matters, right? It, it, if I'm in an organizational change, and you're telling me I've got this great vision, it's going to you know, take our company to standalone strength, which was the RBS <laughs> motto, um, I don't really care about that that much. I want to know who I'm sitting next to. Will my lunchtime change? Is there going to be a car parking space if I move to another office? So actually, the, the kind of detail is the hard bit. The big stuff is the obvious bit. And then one, one final kind of reflection on that. What did everybody do when they sat back down? You, you, you fixed yourself. You went, you went back to normal, right? And that is the biggest challenge in change right now. We can do all this great work, and you can launch lots and lots of new systems. And actually, the, the sort of business world is um, full of stories of organizations that put in new systems. And guess what? Nobody uses them 
Because why? Nobody's engaged with them. Nobody's told them about the change. Nobody's made it real for them. So our tendency as people, um, especially in organizational change, is to revert, revert back to what we're familiar with. You know, you pick up the phone to the people you know that can get things done, even though you've put in a new system. So you've invested millions for people to have a nice <laughs> system, and then somebody just picks up the phone. So that is our, that is our change paradox in many ways. Let me, let me give you some, statistics, some more statistics on this, and my team in the back are going to laugh at this. They know I'm not a numbers guy, so they'll keep me right on the numbers. 54%, and these, these are Gartner um, statistics, only 54% of large transformations are successful, which I guess, if my math is correct, means 46% aren't, right? But only, only roughly half of transformations are successful. That's a, that's a pretty scary number, especially if there's millions of pounds involved. 64%, again, if you were to ask the sort of C-level um, organization, 64% of, of those C-level um, execs would say that they're doing transformation projects. So if 54% aren't successful, but 64% of organizations think that they're doing change. And then if you ask broader within the organization, not just at the C-level, 96% of managers or leaders will say that they are doing change in in initiatives. But the, st the statistic next to it, 47%, this is important, we're, we'll, we'll come to this, only 47% have a business case for their change project. Yeah? Does, that not, does that not surprise people? I, 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 you know, as a, a management consultant, having no business case for your change is probably the biggest reason why your change is going to fail. Because how do you know you're successful? How do you know it's happened if you don't have a business case? But that, that's an alarming statistic. 92%, however, is more, um, more my world. 92% of change professionals will say, without a business case, without a vision, you know, you're going to fail. Yeah? And then finally, 50%. 50% of statistics are all made up. There you go. But, it, but, it, but it's important. You know, th that's the landscape that we're kind of operating in. Yeah? This is an important, um, an important point as well. Um, we're going to talk about what's in it, what's in it for me at some detail. And that, that kind of links back to our personas. I, I think the sort of the ability to make a transformation or a change personal and address the what's in it for me is probably the key to the opposite of that statistic, right? If you don't have a business case, but you can make it relevant for people and address the what's in it for me, you've probably got a much bigger chance of being successful. So this is actually, this is actually I've answered your question here. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a challenging question. What is the biggest change that you've had in your life? Pretend that there's not a house up there. Well, what, what is the biggest change that you've, you've experienced in, in, in your life so far? Thank you. Children? Children? Yeah. Yeah. What, why was that? And, and we'll come back to the reasons why that was, was important in your change. Anybody else had a, a major lifestyle change or anything significant happen in their life recently? Yep. Okay. Yeah. It's a huge, a huge change, right? A huge change. And we all go through, you know, massive kind of changes. I've given you a clue that the top, the top five are sort of morbidly Death is up there, um, you know, changing jobs, new manager. But the top one is usually moving house, right? And, and, and the reason that I'm asking that, I was hoping somebody would say they'd moved house. Anybody moved house? Somebody pretend they've moved house. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dominic, w w w when, you, when you moved house, what was, it, what, was it that, what was the change for you? What was it that attracted you to the house? Uh, it was a uh, lifestyle change. When you come back home, it's absolutely awful to lose one. This was part of that. I mean, yeah. You're taking off. You're taking two, two of the top two there. <laughs> Five years. Yeah. So, to be honest, the decision to relocate, um, yeah, change, change jobs at the same time. So you've got three, you've got three things going on. Yeah. Um, the thing that attracted me to it was because it was a pleasure to see. Yeah. I come from the Midlands. I want to be by the seaside. If 
going to have a choice. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the, the key factor. Yeah. And, and and again, thank you for that. Um, you, you took you took three there. Top the top three almost. <laughs> If the cat had died in, in the middle of that, that would have been sort of four out, four out of five. But um, what do we focus on in change, ironically? If you use the house analogy, you know, Dominic described the experience. It's I wanted to be by, by the sea. There's a vision there. You can, you're imagining yourself by the sea. You're imagining yourself relaxing. I think you've got to carry that with Scotland. Yeah. You've got to say Scotland would be in a beautiful place. So if I was going to move to Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. So, but how many people... Uh, again, this is a broad question, making this very simple. You know, how many people worry about the doors? How many people choose a house based on the doors or the quality of the bricks or how the windows are aligned? I'm, I'm hoping nobody puts that up. That's going to really ruin this analogy. But if you think about how we manage change within our organizations, do we focus on the house and the experience or do we focus on the detail, the bricks, who's going to sit where? the structure, the organization, the new system. And the irony is, no matter how good we think we are at change, is we focus on the wrong thing at the very, very start. So if you were to buy your house and you, know, you were to phone up, let's say, Calla Homes and say, what kind of bricks have you got? People would think you were quite mad. But in most IT transformations in particular, we obsess about the technology, not the experience. And, and, and the one big but the one big mistake I've seen most companies make over the years is they forget why they're doing it, and they forget the customer. Because actually, you know, back to this business case question, why do a change or a transformation, whether it's IT, whether it's you know, uh, you know, just a reorg, why do that unless you really thought about what's the, the reason for it? And the reason for it needs to be customer, if you're, you know, it, and it can be business to business, by the way. So you know, we, we forget about that by, we, we obsess about the bricks and we obsess about organizing it in the building, but we don't actually talk about the experience. So if you think then about making this complex thing simple, what is, what, what is the most important thing then to get right at the very start of, of change? And, and to me, it is the story. It, you know, it is the vision. If we can't connect the story and the vision to the people who are impacted, you know, if I'm going to sit next to John, and you're going to move me across the way, I'm going to be mightily annoyed about that. But if you kind of explain why, and you explain what it's going to look like and why there's a benefit, then this is very, very simple stuff. But actually, most people don't do it. Most people don't do it. So le let me take you through um, a story. I'll, I'll, it, it's Volvo. I think I, I said that. We've been saying the, the automotive, automotive industry. It's Volvo cars. So. I want to talk to you about their a, a client of ours, um, and I want to talk through their transformation story so you get a sense of actually how did the story impact, but also because this is, you know, I'm, I'm probably oversimplifying. I mean, the danger if I stop now, you would probably go just tell a few stories and that's it, which is probably worse than doing nothing at all. I want to show you um, in detail how, whilst it's simple, there's a complexity and there's a level of hard work for change professionals. And uh, can I ask a question, is, is everybody, or the majority of people working as change professionals or connected with a program? Yeah? So uh, I'll, I'll ask my team to answer this as well. What, what typically do people refer to, to change people as? You're smiling. <laughs> what, what, what do you normally get referred to as? There's a fear as well, but I'm picking up on your smile as well. What, have you got something in your head that? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't imagine that every time. Okay. But I imagine that someone who's quite successful, quite yeah. academic based, quite bright, quite successful, quite well respected, but they really understand it. Yeah. Um, in the overriding thing for them, even if it's a campaign or something, it can be absolutely incredible. Um, the, the, the sheer money that is spent is bringing in the um, IT talent to work. Yeah. Um, So, so yeah, so fear, fear has come up a couple of times. People are fearful of change professionals. But actually, within the industry, 
there, there's a really hideous expression, uh, and it's we're the pink and fluffy people, right? There's an even worse term that I, <laughs> I won't use because we're going out live. Um, but it's just about, it's about just making slides, right? Here's a PowerPoint. Here's a deck. That's going to get you through your change. So that there's a sort of you know, a reputation within the industry that that's what change is all about. I want to kind of you know, dispel that myth and take us a little bit deeper. So let, let's talk about Volvo. So Volvo had, um, when we, we first engaged with them, probably about this time last year, they had a number of aspirations. And you know, again, if you, if you look at this, what's really interesting is this is a very internal aspiration. You know, they wanted to be the employer of choice. They wanted to have user-centric tools, and, and for that read, you know, an HR system. They were they were deploying success factors. Um, you know, they wanted to, to manage their kind of employee lifecycle from when you join to you get your first pay slip. That it should be seamless. You know, it, the experience should be good. But think about that as a sort of statement. It's incredibly internal. It's it's about it's all about Volvo, right? It's not about the customer. Uh, it, it's all about Volvo and. Layering on top of that as well, uh, Volvo, had, I'm sure you're aware, have been bought over by a Chinese conglomerate. So their level of change, they used to be owned by Ford, now owned by a Chinese conglomerate. They're going through a massive amount of change just on a daily basis. So you know, not only are you having to work with new colleagues, you're having to relocate potentially to another part of the world. So they had a lot of programs running at the same time. And I think at one stage, where did we get to? 15? 15, 16 major programs, all running with budgets of close to sort of 10 million um, pounds, so a significant amount of change. The problems that they were having um, were none of these projects were talking to each other. Right? So no single project. And, and we had a project um, around the people experience that wasn't talking to IT. So the IT lead and the HR lead did not communicate on a regular basis. Think about the the complexity and the mess that that, you know, that that is going to cause for an organization. So what, what did we do about that? We realized that actually the main reason, and this is again back to my business case analogy, Volvo did not have a business case to manage you know, 15 projects, each with a, a budget of about 10 million. Can you imagine having a budget of 150 million being a program director and not having a business case? It's just insane. So the very first thing that we did, you know, and uh, there were some slides involved. We did make some slides. We did some classic change stuff. But we spent a long time sitting with, the, with this group of people and said, look, why are you doing this? Do you know why they're doing it? And they said, it's a good question. I was going to try and do a Swedish accent there, but I'm, I usually end up sounding Welsh, so I will not do a Swedish accent. Um, we had to sit with them and work out what their business case was for each and every single program. So when we say that change is just the, the kind of easy stuff, incredibly difficult to sit down you know, 15 program leads and get them to come up with a business case. However, what we did, instead of focusing on, I guess, just the numbers, we asked them, what, do you, what does it look like in the future for, and again, we'll come back to the persona, what does it look like for that individual once they've gone through that project? Talk to me about behaviors. And when we asked that question, we saw a massive shift because they were no longer scared of the sort of, you know, the fearful side of it. They were like, okay, so I, I know that actually, do you know what, I'm going to be impacted by this. I need to understand what it'll mean with my engagement with HR. I'm a, let me focus in on the HR program. I now know where I need to go for my pay slip, right? And, uh, you know, it's going to be a new way of working. Once we got them to focus on the behaviors, and this is just an extract of a, a spreadsheet which is huge. Every single um, behavior was detailed. So when I say complex, right, you're looking at probably you know, 15,000 employees. Trying to understand what their behavior and what their experiences is, is where you start. That's your business case in many ways. <laughs> what will people be doing differently? What is the behavior? What are they doing now? How do I help them through that journey? So that, that was the first thing that we did. The, um, the, the, the second thing that we did with them was anybody familiar with the sort of drawing on the, the left-hand side? Anybody employed or used visual kind of artists to create a vision? Very, very interesting people. <laughs> they, they, they tend to be not just you know, creative in terms of um, artistic, but they tend to be very good strategic thinkers. And, and, and we sat um, the 15 programs down. We said, so what's your vision for this? What's your story? What does it look like? And this is an example of you know, the output. 
And people talk in metaphors, and they say, you know, there's, there's, there's a mountains ahead, there's challenges. Okay, tell me what that looks like. Explain to me in, in detail what are those challenges. And once people move from the visual into the behaviors, they then have a roadmap of how to tackle it, right? So not only, do you, you know, not only did we help them, I suppose, come up with a business case, but we also got them to articulate it in, in a way that they could share. And by the way, visuals like this, you, know, you can sit in a room with a team and, and talk to the visual and go, this is where you sit in part of that story. I know that you've got change coming. This is what I'm going to do for you. I know that you're going to have to move offices. That's a big move for you. But you know, I'm going to help you through that sort of change journey. So visualizing where you're trying to get to. Um, and it doesn't have to be as, as kind of interesting, as creative as that. But just getting your change program team at the very start why are we doing this? What's the, vi what's the vision? What's the reason? And what are the numbers that we can measure ourselves on? Because actually, when you've delivered the new change, what, what is your instinct? Go back to the analogy of getting undressed. Poor choice of words. Um, changing yourself. Go back to the analogy. I mean, our tendencies are we then revert, right? So you, you, you've delivered all this great stuff. Any, anybody an IT project manager? So what, 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 what is your big day of the year? typically on a project. Yeah, it's go live, right? Then, then it's like, job done, balloons go up, t-shirts come on, um, we've delivered the new system, happy days is all good, right? And then nobody, you don't probably know, worried about what happens next, right? Sorry, I'm painting a very bad picture of my, my IT colleagues. I love you. Um, but that, that's my world, right? The system becomes go live, and then everybody goes, change, we've done it. What, what do you think is the real measure of, of success for a change initiative? So if day one is today, what, what is the real measure of success? Give it a, an estimate in days, on average. Very close to that, 90 days. 90 days is what you measure your change at. And you get your business case out that whole way through it and go, are we hitting these KPIs? Are we seeing the shift in behavior? Or are we still seeing Johnny Park in the same car park that we told him not to because he's now in the other campus? You know, it's, that's where you see where change is actually happening. So getting your vision right, getting your story, getting a way to measure it, and not just saying, I've, I've, I've gone live, or we've reorged. That's, that's kind of half the story. It's half the story. So you've got personas on your desk. And I said I would go into this in some detail. The ability to make and connect change. So this level of complexity, you know, think, think about Volvo, the, you know, the 15,000 people, some of them working quite, you know, quite literally on a production line, manufacturing something. How do I connect from a central point in a project team, sitting in a room like this? How do I connect with that person? I've got to understand what that person does for a start. Right? And uh, again, I think sometimes there's a little bit of arrogance in our industry um, as IT professionals. Or we kind of think we do the magic, therefore everybody will like it. And we've got some cool stuff. We're putting in a new system, therefore all, all is good. The ability to create a persona, to understand what that person does, whether it's pulling a lever, whether it's you know, making something uh, in, in a restaurant, to get to that level of detail is where you see the magic. And, and I, want to, I want to illustrate that. I'm going to ask you as we go through this a little bit. Um, and maybe we'll use this as feedback, actually, towards the end. Think about the way I've laid out the persona. Think about what you understood about change before you arrived today. What do you know now? So after the session, what do you know now? And then this is where the magic happens here. It's in this little box down here. This is a very simplified version of a persona. You know, how do we, how do we help you get to know more? How, how do we take you on that journey? So the ability to be able to sit and understand what a person does now. You know, I, I pull a lever, I manufacture a bulb. Can you, can you manufacture a bulb with a lever in the Volvo workplace? What are you going to do differently? You know, you, how, how do I get there? And it's, it's funny, it's almost back to um, you know, time and motion studies. Anybody, anybody grew up with time and, and motion studies? Yeah. You know, this is where the complexity is. We sometimes have to get in there and for a very annoying reason, we missed our tour of the factory on several occasions in Volvo, but we had to bring in you know, the people who actually did the work and talk to them. You've got to get into the detail you know, and, and the complexity of this before you should even start 
trying to change someone's job, right? So we'll use this a little bit of feedback, but it, it, it's a very visual representation of, you know, what do I do if I work in accounts? What will that, you know, will, will, will spreadsheets disappear? Will it all be on a new system? Will I be able to seamlessly connect with finance? Yeah, but how do I get you there? This, this is where the real detail of change comes in. And again, what we're seeing is a lot of success with this. Because, you know, we could create a story, and I could tell you that story, about why the organization, why, why is Volvo changing? But if that doesn't resonate with you on the production floor, you're not going to pay any attention to it. And I think, again, this is back to our complexity. If you're also being hit with 10 or 15 different initiatives, you better make sure that your story is incredibly important and, and impactful at that individual level. Yeah? So personas are an incredibly key part to making you know, change relevant and making it personalized. And without, without kind of being too ageist, if we look around the room, we're not really the generation, I guess, that, that feels you know, changes uh, at, at the pace that they do. We're a bit more you know, reluctant sometimes to change. There's an audience out there you know, under 25, under 30, who just want everything now. They want it on their phone. You know, they, they want that sort of instant, um, you know, tell me about it now, next thing, right? They're moving on to the next thing. If we can impact that member of staff quickly with a message which is relevant and interesting and tells them what they need to do and why, you've missed the boat in change, right? Because they're on to the next thing. And again, with companies, you've got 15 programs. You're competing, right? So personas was the one thing that really stood out for, for Volvo. They were like, yeah, I get that now. And, and I, I can now articulate to somebody in China, somebody in Gothenburg, and somebody in Ghent, which is where their three big production sites are, in a way which is incredibly relevant and individual and tailored. So it, it's about tailoring the message. The other element, and again, this is, what, this is why I sort of keep referring to the fact that classic change is, is a little bit dead. You can't sit in, as a program team in a nice office like this and pontificate about how well change is going unless you're involved in the, the whole process. And change teams, again, I'll ask the question um, to our IT professionals. What is the first thing in a program where you cut budgets? What, what was the first budget that gets cut on a, on a large program? Communications change management, it's the first thing that we cut from a program because people just see it as, it's, a, it's irrelevant, I can do that myself, I can do it centrally. But if you have a, a very skilled change team and you bring them in from the start, and this is what we did with Volvo, we brought our team in on day one when we were in the design stage. We're designing the system, we're designing the way of working. And the value of bringing your change team in at the start and treating them as part of the program is they then have the eye on the end user the whole way through. Typically, what happens on a, on a change initiative is somebody gets to about three weeks before go live, three months before go live, and goes, oh, we better tell some people about this. We better, we better engage the business, right? Once you get to that point, you've lost the battle. You're bringing change in way, way, way too late. Our, our learning and, and, and what we're discovering increasingly is, and clients like this, by the way, and, and, and change works when you do this. You bring your change professionals in from day one. They sit in somewhat tedious process mapping exercises and they, they help drive that. And I mean, the, the, the three colleagues at the back, if you were to put them in a, a room with a, you know, the big brown IKEA wrapping paper, you put that up on the wall and you give them yellow stickies, you'll see these guys go into a frenzy. They love that, right? It's detailing out your processes. They may not know the industry. They might not know your process, but the skill set to be able to work through processes drives thinking around, OK, so if that's what I'm going to do today, sorry, that's what I do today, what is um, Sarah in accounts going to do tomorrow? It's that gap in the middle, right? And that's back to your persona. That's where the change happens, right? It's not at the end, and it's not sort of with an email. It's about being able to relate to, to people you know, in, their, in their place of work, articulate exactly what their process is. And by the way, when you sit with someone, and this is back to you know, the time and motion studies without the clipboard, and, and the stopwatch. If you spend time sitting with somebody who's going to be impacted by change, tell them a little bit why you're there, why the project's going to be a good thing. You've started the change journey, but they will have a hell of a lot more um, respect for your program because you've actually come to their place of work, where they sit, and tried to understand exactly what it's going to be like for them. 
And these people become your advocates. These, these are the people who then become a bit annoying, I'll be honest, but they'll keep phoning you and emailing you, go, when's it gonna happen? Can I be involved? Can I get into the process workshops? You generate enthusiasm and you generate buy-in just by sitting with people and asking them what their, their job looks like now and how you can help them. So personas at the start, um, you know, at the heart of, of what you do, will you know, fast track your change program exponentially. You know, don't underestimate it. Um, as, a, as a colleague of, of mine who's not, I can say he's not here, he is alive, but he's not here with us today, um, it's Bill. Uh, uh, Bill was from Rosyth and he worked um, in basically building one of the, the aircraft carriers before he started in consulting. And it was him who taught me that. There's two things that he did very, very well, and <laughs> this sounds terrible. I'm not advocating by any means that you send your colleagues out for a smoke, right? But he would go and he would stand with people and he would smoke, or he would go to the coffee lounge, and that's where he found out where things were working or where they weren't working, because he was prepared, you know, because he'd worked in a, you know, a heavily manual industry, he knew exactly how people thought, and he wasn't scared to sort of go out there, sit and talk, um, find out what's really happening, what their jobs, you know, who hates who, how do we fix that? You know, and he was an incredible source of, um, I, keep, I keep talking about him as if he's dead, he's not dead. Incredible source of just insight into that because he had worked in, you know, in, in that sort of industry. He could sit with somebody and understand their process. It doesn't matter if he, you know, whether it was a mortgage application or whether it was a, you know, an HR system, he could map that out because he'd spent the time, right? So, so don't underestimate that, that, that ability to have a cigarette, <laughs> other, other, other products are available or a coffee, um, it, it, you know, it's incredibly powerful when you're, you're talking about change. So that in many ways was the Volvo journey. It was the ability to be, you know, involved at the very, very start. We had a change team of about four people. Typically on a program of, of that scale, you would sort of have two and they would come in six months down the line and you would start your communications with, you know, three months to go. But actually, we, we kind of flipped it on our head, on its head. We got involved at the start, and actually, we, we drove much more of the activities that way. We got much better buy-in from the business. We then found that the business wanted to lend us people, right? Because actually, I'm talking about this in quite a, a project abstract. What, what is the hardest thing you know, as a project is actually the engagement with the business. Because actually, the business will always say, what will the business say when you throw another project at them? If you're asking for resources, for example. Too busy. Too busy, yeah. You're too busy because they're doing other change, right? And you're not the only program in town. So the ability to engage with the business, you know, it's almost, it is almost that go for a smoke with them. Find out what their real pressures are. How do we engage them in this? How do we bring them into the, the process? And I think that's where we were incredibly successful with Volvo. And we, we've now templated this approach a little bit. So a little bit of blatant, um, kind of publicity. This is our change wheel. It started off as a, um, it looked like, remember the Trivial Pursuit wheel? It was a little bit like the, the Trivial Pursuit, but over the last year, has this approach has kind of um, emerged and changed and transformed. And I have a, a, a team of incredibly smart people, um, which is great for me because I'm, I'm not as, as, as smart as my own team, who've worked on this and, and turned it into, it's effectively a robust toolkit where I can go in and I can click and open any of those tabs. And I mean, let's look at um, where we got vision and benefits, right? I can open that vision and benefits tab and I can see examples of exactly where we've done vision for different clients. I can see how to do it. You know, I've got a toolkit now that I can sit with a client and we can work through that whole change lifestyle, sorry, life cycle. And that's why I'm saying it's not simple, right? There's a complexity behind this there's a level of, of management activity, there's a level of reporting, there's a level of status, there's a level of project plan. You know, and again, that's why I get quite offended when people say that change is easy. It's just the pink and fluffy stuff, right? It's actually the hard stuff. And you know, my, my, IT, my IT colleagues hate me because I just refer to their stuff as the easy bit. You just switch it on, right? If it doesn't work, you switch it off. It's as simple as that. That's my view of IT, right? They don't get this because this is the hard stuff. This is about engaging people, it's about, you know, behind this sits probably 3,000 spreadsheets. You know, behind this sits hours and hours and hours of PowerPoint. Behind this sits years and years of, of examples of where it's worked really well. So you get a, good tool, get a good toolkit, get a good approach, get a good plan, 
Otherwise, you know, your change initi initiative will just drift and ultimately fail. And perhaps to finish off, and I think I've probably, I've probably done that a little bit earlier, don't underestimate the amount of time that it takes to get your change embedded. And actually, the best thing you can do, if you're in the middle of a change at the moment and you're sort of going, well, we haven't done that, we haven't done the persona approach, we've done a little bit of communications, we're not really, by the way, no change program is 100% perfect. Even with that toolkit, you're still only looking at an 80% success rate. You will not use all those components, right? So don't, please don't feel beaten up if you haven't started that journey. But if you are on that journey and you still feel there are gaps, the most important thing you can do is actually say, okay, here's where we are. It is what it is. Um, but let's focus on after go live. So let, let's think about if there's a reorg, how do we ensure that behaviors don't go back to the way they were? And, and put in some really robust kind of plans around that. You know, and, and checkpoints and daily checkpoints if you need it. You know, it's like, you know, are we seeing a reduction in call numbers? Are we seeing, you know, people behaving in a different way? That's when you'll see change. Because when you do that, and the answer is no, we're not seeing it, what does that stimulate? More activity, right? So actually, when, when things aren't working and you put your 90-day view in, you can stimulate your project, even if you're towards the end of it. So never underestimate um, that 90-day period. 30 days, take a benchmark at the end of 30 going, how far away are we from the business case? Have we, have we got somewhat? Are we close? What are our measures? You know, and drill, you know, as change, as change managers or change professionals, grill your project about that, right? Grill the IT people. What are the defects? You know, what are the call volumes? What are those measurements? And give them a hard time, right? Why are we not seeing that? And then as change people, we can act on that, right? So don't give up on day one or day two. You've got your t-shirt and your balloon. You know, keep going after 30 or 60 or 90 days. So, how am I for time? Am I right? I'm almost there. All right. So maybe in conclusion, and I know I've tried to cover quite a lot in a very short period of time. And again, that's, that's thanks to Keith. You've got 45 minutes to talk about the world of change. Hopefully what I've demonstrated is probably these four key things. You've got to start with a vision and a, and a, and a business case, right? If you're on a project right now, like literally, if you leave the office or the, uh, the meeting today and you don't have a business case or you know that there's a project that doesn't have one, you're on, a, you're on a road to not being as successful as you could be. So, you know, insist that there's a business case and, and articulate it in behaviors, numbers, ways of working. Look at things from, you know, find somebody in the office who you know who will be impacted or, or, or in the, you know, wherever you work. Think about that from their perspective, right? If you're delivering this huge program, how will they be impacted by it? And you know, go and sit with them, articulate what's happening, get a feel for what that change is going to be for them, because then you start making an impact, because you're impacting on the on the individual. So that's our persona approach. Define the end state. Define the end state in terms of behaviors, as much as you know efficiencies, right? What, what will people be doing differently? How will they feel? How will they think? Because actually, by doing that as well, you tend to find even more savings if you talk about what the behaviors will be like. Yeah? So really focus on, on that. And then maybe the most important one, I didn't prioritize those, but maybe the most important one is it, it doesn't start. Uh, so it doesn't end at go live. It kind of starts at go live. Your, your change doesn't really start until day one. And then you keep measuring it. You know, don't, don't give up once the system is switched on. So there we go. A little bit of a, a kind of high level view, but also hopefully some detail there in, in the Volvo way of working, getting into the detail and, and demonstrating that you know it, it, it's challenging, but if you put in the right plan, the right methods, and you, and you kind of relate to people, this is where you, you find change programs are much more successful. So thank you. Um, I hope you got something from that. We do have, as I said, I put these guys on the spot because I've talked for 45 minutes now. Um, I'm sure you're glad if I stop. We've got three colleagues um, who are more than happy to answer any of your questions. Obviously, I'm still happy to answer questions, but I, wanna, I want them to, to earn their, their crust for coming through today. So if you've got any questions on change, on Volvo, by all means, please, um, please ask. Thank you. Yeah. 
it, it's, it's, I mean, it's interesting because Volvo in, in Sweden is integrated. When you, have you been to Gothenburg before? Yeah, when, when you go into Gothenburg and you go through Gothenburg Airport, you, you've got a baggage claim, and the reclaim, and on each baggage reclaim, there is a Volvo car. I, I mean a full-size Volvo car. As you leave the airport, there's a sign bigger than the sign for HCL, which says, Welcome to Volvo Town. It's cultural, and, and this is why change is incredibly difficult, because what, and maybe this, the question you're asking is, the Chinese culture is very different. The, the, the Swedish culture is very... They finish work, and they used to make us laugh. They finish work at 3.23, right? Because they, in, the, in the production line, they've measured everything down to the nth degree. And they, they measure time in, was it ten, in tenths, not sixtieths? So they don't even use a conventional clock. That's how cultural this is. So when the, you know, when the, when the Chinese culture and that meet, you get a lot of clash. You get a lot of conflict because you know they're not family focused in the way Volvo people are. They're produce, get results, get, get the numbers up. And what, what we found is we had to send people to China. You know, you, you can't manage a Chinese kind of program from Gothenburg or from Edinburgh when I was on the phone with them. You, you physically have to go there. So this is back to that sort of persona based. The Chinese came, you know, would come to, to Volvo as well in Gothenburg, and then they got a feel for culture. So actually, the whole culture piece was just as important as the as the as the IT piece, but again, you know, taking it back to the persona, you know, it's the person who works in the production line in China needs the same amount of love as the person who works on the production line in, in Gothenburg. Did that, did that answer? Yeah. Thank you, Johnny. Oh, sorry. Um. So. In our department, we don't have 10 million pounds, um, and yet we still need to go through a change process. I mean, when, I, when I look at the, your change wheel and the, pro, it's clearly the experience of managing large, complex uh, 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 program changes. Um, and yeah, I, I suspect the, the, the principles that you've espoused are, are the same, but how, any advice as to how to manage a, like a more of a departmental change that yeah. doesn't have 10 million quid to spend? I'm gonna let Keith answer that. <laughs> in terms of that, it's so easy to know if you've been at department for anything in life now. What you drive in that change, that you have a strategy to lead your organisation, you need to understand that and then how can you impact on the people in the department? What are the changes you need for them? You need to understand that vision of why you're doing it, what can you impact on them? I ran an example of working with one organisation recently and we were putting a change to the reception of one of the departments. And the we engineered the process so we know we'll get this working right. Uh, and then the vision was we're gonna let the end of it. But what they didn't do was look at what's the change the impact on the people. And they had people authorising certain parts of it which we weren't responsible for, responsible for. What they were now gonna do is authorise the company. Who would have told them that? So you've got to take this working, but because that was managed to change fully, then understand why that came down to it. It's been a delay. So that's how you you got a lot of resentment for that. I don't know how to authorise something, I don't know how to authorise for it. So you're doing it in smaller scales. It's looking at the same thing, how do you impact the staff, what are the changes you need to do, what are the changes you can impact on them. A soft team feel, a soft perception. Then you do it at the town hall, you can explain it. You can explain that, that you do it at the beginning, but explain it at the end. The staff are telling us why you're doing this, what the impact will look like, what's your input to it, what's your idea for it. And then we see that the end of the day. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if it's Volvo or it's one of the factories. Uh, it's the same principles that apply. We're doing it and you don't need 10 million pounds for this. Uh, and it's not just about the input and it's not just involved in what you think the brand set the impact. What are the things you set from them? And if I'm doing it as a manager, and I'm not the change manager, I'm just the manager, I still have to understand what they look like to match that. I still have to understand the changes in the processes, the changes in the impact, the changes in the behaviour. And I need to talk to them about that. And I think that's the engagement process. You can feel that throughout the process. You don't need to buy any other people. You don't need 10 million pounds. You don't need to be a Volvo. You can do it at yeah. a team, team level, department level, as Keith likes to say, yeah. any way. So the tool kit is still here. Yeah. It, 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 uh, I, would over, I would have overly simplified that answer, I think, and said it doesn't matter if it's one person or 100 people. 
the, the activities are exactly the same. The cost just goes up because of the volume of people, but the, the same amount of hard work to get that person over the line and the same amount of drive applies. You know, it, it's use the toolkit, use the approaches, but if it's one person, you still have to put the same amount of effort in. If it's 100 people, you just need more people to do it. So, yeah, thanks, Charlie. Hi, yeah. I work for a, a public organisation. I just wonder, you mentioned a lot of statistics there, and I just wonder, is there a statistic that's acceptable where you write off people, the, the, the negative people that you'll never bring along um, with a positive attitude? Yeah. Um, and does it, you know, explain the benefits, explain your vision, explain the, the impact, acknowledge some of the challenges, uh, say how you're going to manage those, mitigate them. Yeah. Um, but do you get to a point that you have to give up your efforts and think, is this representative of the whole workforce? I'm leaving that lost sheep behind yeah. and I'm going with the rest of the flock. Yeah, and it, it, I mean, it's interesting because those are weirdly the people that we love. In a, in a sort of weird way, because actually that's your that's your very literal litmus test. If you've got a grumpy John or a you know a grumpy Sarah, those are the people that you actually target more effort at, because they will they will be the the, the, the temperature check. And I, I worked in a um, before I started in consulting, we had somebody within the office when I worked in standard life. Oh, sorry, it's too low. Scotland's too small. You might know this person anyway. And she was just grumpy all the time. You know, nothing was right. Nothing worked. Um, what we did with that person was we invited her onto the project. Come and join the project. Don't suffer in silence. Come and be part of it. And actually, that person became the biggest advocate eventually because they felt engaged, right? The, the, the stats around that, um, I do have a slide somewhere, but it's not, not in today's. I can give you them afterwards. But actually, those are the people that you want to engage because you know, once you convert that person from being Grumpy John or Grumpy Sarah and they're an advocate, then you're on to a winner. But, to push it even further, right? yeah, there are some people who just will never want, want to. I mean, we're, you know, there's some changes, none of it. Nobody likes change. That's the other reality, right? So you're right. But, uh, but I think the best way to manage that individual or individuals, invite them onto the project. You know, tell us, tell us why you don't think it'll work because they know why it won't work. And then you can do something about it. So grumpy people are good people in a weird sort of way. I'd rather have 10 grumpy people on a project team than 10 really switched on, because they'll just do it. You know, the switched on people do it the right way. Your grumpy people, you know exactly what your real obstacles are going to be. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And there are some people you just have to go, sorry, grumpy John, that's just the way it is. <laughs> yeah. Is it project led? Is it just general? That's what they like. So if it's just general, that's, that's just performance management. Yeah. That's, that's you dealing with somebody who's just general grumpy. You manage that as a performance. If it's got to do with the project and they're grumpy because of the project, why are they grumpy because of the project? What's driving them that way? Why is that behaviour happening? And then yeah. how I manage that once I understand that. So it is about talking to them, engaging with them, listening to them. But if it's just somebody who's grumpy all the time, yeah. that's that's just a manager to manage that performance management. It's to understand why they're grumpy. And sometimes they're grumpy for the right reason. It's just we haven't picked that up. Yeah. And if you don't talk to them, engage with them, you lose that. Yeah. And I mean, you're, you're unhappy employees are your are not your best employees, but you, it's the best source of information about your organization, right? You know, it's listen to these people. Um, they, they will give you, they'll also give you the answers nine times out of ten. And uh, this person I'm thinking of came up with an absolutely fantastic solution um, around, they, they were constantly grumpy because they were having to phone and do credit checks. They came up with an automated process to do credit checks, which we implemented. Wouldn't my life be easier if we just did that automatically? We went, yeah, you probably would, and it would save us a lot of money. So their grumpiness drove change. That's the title for our next talk. Grumpiness drives change. There we go. It's a good question, though. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. Cheers. You mentioned that if you bring in management or change professionals towards the end of a pro project, you're basically on a hiding to nothing. Um, Prior to joining the university, um, I worked in the private sector, yeah. um, and I worked on projects that were both well and poorly managed. Um, I actually worked for TUI when the last Thomas Cook okay. change was happening, yeah. um, and I saw an example of it being done very well at TUI, which is why maybe TUI are now successful and Thomas Cook are out of business. Um, what's your advice if you are working on a project and 
maybe the, cha the change has happened, uh, it's been poorly received yeah. and, and the people are resisting change. What's your advice then if you do have to fight the fires late on in the process? Yeah, uh, again, a, a good question. Um, I think what's interesting as well, and this, this speaks a lot about maybe change professionals in general, sometimes change professionals can be very focused on the people side of things and, and there's an emotional connection there. But the reality sometimes in business is you have to have hard conversations and that's going to upset somebody and it might not be what you want to have the conversation. There's an ability, I think, to be able to use fact in that. And I work with a colleague who is, I'm not going to name her, she might be watching, but she's the best communicator I've ever met because she just manages everything with fact. And you know, she would come in and say, the reason there's, a, there's not a 17% increase is because of X, Y, and Z. And that's not a motive. That person doesn't get upset. And that person doesn't, not that they don't care, they, they, they don't worry about how that's going to be presented because it's just fact. And I think sometimes change professionals can be a little bit, we can sometimes be a wee bit touchy-feely, right? And that's probably why we're, we're known as pink and fluffy in the industry, because we're focused on people. But sometimes you just have to manage by fact. And the best change people that I've seen are the ones that don't really shy away from things. Because if you don't address it, it just becomes a bigger problem. So, you know, fact, fact-based, information you can't argue with it it's just this is the reason why and here's what i'm going to do about it it's always it's hard for change people to do but you know typically you just have to be very factual and you know tackle it as it is did that answer okay thank you yeah uh, yeah my question mine is actually really similar to yours and uh, similarly we work for a global logistics company who implemented success factors um last year but at the same time decided to implement a new payroll system okay <laughs> uh, unfortunately, the new payroll system just went catastrophically wrong. So basically, in line with success factors, the whole payroll structure was completely messed up. So yeah. now both are seen as aligned. Um, now we've got success factors implemented, but everything we try and do with it is just met with such distrust. So we've really, our yeah. whole organisation really has lost trust in probably the HR department they see us as the face of it. Um, we're now in a position, it's not going anywhere, it's, it's there to stay, um, but we're, we're just getting such pushback from everyone. Yeah. And I think everything we try and do to make it positive just is met as a kind of a token gesture. So yeah. we're kind of struggling just to go out there and, and push it back through again and, and relaunch the change, if you like, but put a positive spin on it and start to just get that trust back. So yeah. I don't know if there's anything, as I said, similar that when it goes wrong, is there anything else you would advise that? Yeah, that and it, it, it's funny. And one of my colleagues, High Kartik, who, who deals with this on a day-to-day -day basis, the, the, and I'm sorry if this is not, if this is a very specific question, and there's a theme in here without me being too detailed about the systems in themselves. The reason why you're meeting with so much resistance, if you think about it from not, uh, not the, the, the success factors, but the payroll side, it's the one thing that you can't mess up in business, right? You know, it's somebody's pay. You can get away with absolute murder, you know, and you can treat people badly. <laughs> Not that I'm advocating that, but if you mess their payroll up, right, and they don't get paid, that is your biggest pain point. So, you know, the, I think what tends to happen on programs like that is payroll sometimes managed by either a third party or um, nobody knows where all the data is. So when you're trying to merge data and bring it into one system, HR doesn't always have that data. You, you then go and you ask other parts of the, you know, they ask the business, where is the data? That is when we went back to the Volvo example, that is your single point of failure on a big program like that. Where is the information held? Who owns it? You know, and everybody thinks HR have it. HR think IT have it. IT think HR have it, right? So uh, maybe your question is how do you recover? Is that is that more? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's, it's, a really, it's a really hard one, right? Because if you've, you've made people upset about their, their, their HR, sorry, their payroll, then you do a road trust. Uh, and that's just, that's hard to avoid. But you, I would go back, it's back to that sort of persona approach. You know, think about, you know, if you're sitting there and doing scenarios at the start of the program, what would happen if that person doesn't get paid? And then you work out the scenario and you do something about it. And then you communicate around that saying, you know, we're gonna do this major, um, there's gonna be a massive impact on your payroll. You send them, you know, endless emails, desk drops. You, with payroll, you hit people <laughs> with everything. You know, you more or less go and sit next to them and talk them through it, right? But that's a very targeted change campaign that you sort of have to go, we cannot make a mistake on this. Um, and it, it, by the way, you're not the only person who's been in that. Anybody who works with 
um, payroll and HR systems bringing together will at some point make that mistake. And, and let, me let me share, it's, it's a, this is a story rather than a direct answer where you might find something interesting. About 10 years ago, I, I did a, a payroll um, program and um, we were communicating and we were communicating daily and we were updating. And what we were doing is we were using screenshots, which was given to us by the third party. Using screenshots every single day, telephone calls, meetings, town halls, you know, everywhere. So as nobody made a mistake. Right? It was going particularly well. A large bank in America, um, clues in the name. What did I do? I was sent a, a pay slip. Right? I was told, send that out to the program team, get it validated, make sure it's the right <laughs> information. You're seeing where this is going. What did I forget to do? I forgot to cover up the name of the person <laughs> whose pay slip it was, which went out to 10,000 people. Thankfully, that person, they all knew how much they got paid and they were quite cool about it. But you know, that's a classic example. If you get something wrong in, in a payroll program, you're gonna have to dig yourself out of a, a big hole. And uh, they were very kind and gracious and didn't shoot me, um, which is unusual for Americans. But um, they, uh, yeah, if you get it wrong, it goes wrong spectacularly. So think about the worst case scenario in something like that. It's that person. What will happen to that person? Will, you know, will they not be able to pay their mortgage? Will they not be able to pay their bills? And that usually then makes you think about how do I avoid that happening? How do I tell them? How do I make sure? Yeah, it, it puts a bit of fear back into it, right? One of the things that we learned is that some of your answers were
<laughs> don't, don't, <laughs> just get career limiting move, trust me. <laughs> but I mean, if, if in doubt, bring in the consultants and you can blame us. That's what most people do, so. <laughs> yeah. So. I've got Abdul Razak, and he is on our live chat at the moment. Oh, hi. And he is from our ISB in Bangalore, right? So it's a wee double-edged question here okay. for you, just to keep you on your toes. Um, how can SMEs adopt change management, especially when the headcount and the functional areas are less? But even so, how can the SMEs create a persona landscape when there is only one resource who's handling different functions? Yeah. So they've got many hats on. Yeah, and um, let me see. No, okay, Stephen doesn't want to answer. That's fine. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to oversimplify the answer because, you know, I think we said if it's one person or it's one hundred, it's it's not overly different. Um, if you've got one person, in many ways, it's actually easier because the, the the change campaign is not as broad. You know where that one person is. Sometimes, actually, geographically, it can be hard. Um, we were, we, were, we were putting together a proposal for an organization which had one person actually in, in about 52 Indian offices. So there's, you know, 60 people. How do you get around 60 people and do a persona with them? That becomes harder than 60 people in one office. So, but, but I think, I mean, the answer to that is you use the same text. I'm, I'm looking at you, sorry. Use the same techniques, caller. Um, you know, it, it, it's very much around, um, you know, having an approach sitting with with that person or you know if you can't physically go there you know, do it do a call and understand how they work um so one person you know or a hundred people it, it's the same approach just different numbers can't i can't tell if i've answered that question they might they might swear online at me that might give me an indication right um if i can back you up, if I can back you up on that i'm a business coach we work with smes all the time and change management essentially is that really is what all businesses are going through uh, and just to, to answer that caller's point so many SMEs their persona is made up of many functions yeah. um, but as you point out it, it's it's the persona what yeah. so what is that person doing yeah so it's just finding out what that individual is involved therefore what parts of that business's day-to-day -day activities are being impacted yeah um, whether it's just singular function or multifunction still works Good answer, thank you. You've, Stephen owes you a beer. Thank you. So what, what, the question for Stephen there is he's, he's getting off the hook. He's getting off the hook. Have we got any other questions? <laughs> you said at the beginning that organizations change all the time. Is there a possible danger with too much change that you can actually end up having change fatigue? And how would you address that within organisations? Um, I, I mean, I think that's a great, it's a great spot, because actually, in the last, as I said, in the last 15 years, change was quite, well, I'm sorry, 12 years, so quite linear and quite predictable, you know, whether it was driven by regulation or whether it was driven just by an upgrade or, you know, a reorganisation. I think you're absolutely spot on. In the last three years, the complexity of change is, you know, has gone exponentially. And if you, you look at some of the alarming statistics, in terms of people's kind of mental health and how they're coping with that. And that's why I said it's a broader topic for another day. I'm not sure as human beings that we're capable of coping with a lot of the change that's thrown at us, um, you know, regularly. But again, you know, as change professionals, we would say you kind of have to accept that. But it also then means the effort that you put in has to be even more personal. If that's almost like a, an irony, the more change there is, the more personal you have to become. And again, because companies tend to sort of throw away change and dismiss it, they don't then see the benefits and then wonder why. So if you've got a change team and you only have two people on it, when you actually need 30 people, but I'm not prepared to invest 10 million, but if, if, you're, you know, if, you're, if your system benefits equate to you know, 100,000 or 100 million, your investment you know, is directly proportionate. And sorry, that sounds very salesy. It's not meant to. Um, you know, you, you get back what you put into change, but if there's a lot of complexity, uh, my answer would be you always just ramp up your change agents. And if it's not, it doesn't have to be external. It can be internal. It can be Grumpy John. Get all your Grumpy Johns, right? Grumpy Sarahs. Get them focused on it. And then the business owns change. So it becomes less of a, it's all coming from all over. Manage it centrally. Involve the business. Um, and, and sometimes that, you know, the gophers, you pop up and you knock them down a little bit. 
But you're absolutely right. It is, I think we're, in, in a lot of industries, we're reaching that sort of point of there's just a lot of change, right? And, and that, has, that has negative impacts on, on everyone involved, yeah. <laughs> There's two, there's two words that I, well, there's one word that I like and there's one word that I dislike that is currently in vogue. Big fan of agile, you know, the ability to, to flex and move. And, you know, if we took our, let's go back to the wheel, whilst it, whilst it looks like you do it in a circular way, you start somewhere, it's not always the case. You move around, right? It's the, the ability to be agile and move to the problem that's in front of you. I, I, like, I like agile. I like that sort of mentality. The, the one word that I, I dislike enormously is resilience. And we talk about resilience in, in, in business a, a lot. You people have got to be resilient, right? And you know, to, to your question about is there too much change? I think sometimes we use the word resilience to bully people into doing more, right? But you know, but, but in the true sense, resilience is your ability to absorb more. But actually, in business, we sometimes push it as a way of going. You've got to be more resilient means suck up a lot more, right? So it's the kind of the contradiction of agile is great because it means we can flex and adapt adapt but you know stressing resilience and saying you've got to be more resilient it's not the right answer you know you, you've got to be more agile not more resilient in many ways And then there's a principle in, in, in Agile, if you're familiar with it as well, is, you know, fail fast. If you're going to fail, do it quickly, get it up and move on to the next thing, right? You know, if it's not going to work, fail fast and, and, and just move on. Yeah. We're moving quite off topic on the Agile. That's, that's, at, that's at one o'clock. <laughs> there was another question over here. Or is somebody just waving? <laughs> Yeah. 
consultant to make sure it's that strategy actually fit the purpose to say that. And, and, and to identify and look at what the changes are going to be and that was built in and then to start to look at how we do that as well as those. So we're not trying to do everything big bang. We're trying to think about for this new strategy, this looks like a team in three years, how do we build that over three years and then how we build in that agile working. Which is I think we need to get caught up with we have a three year strategy, that's fit into that and it's really talk about it. It's about the path of fitting down, but I'm doing a strategy that's changed where it's supposed and where it's going to work. And then how do we build an agile approach to that and make it work and do the small part. So once you do it, you need to fit link. But if you think then of big big bands, you four or five big bands, you get the public sector and start changing it up. It's about seeing the fit link, the thing really needs to be work and to do it building that in to make sure it fits into the strategy of that probably from plan year one to make sure year three keeps it up there. Uh, and trying to get up those strategic plans actually fit the purpose. Yeah. Thank you. I I'm I'm getting the sign that we've maybe got time for one more question. Yeah. Two. Thank you. Please, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it's kind of a great model. So you can, if it's a, I'm guessing it's a three-letter acronym company. <laughs> it's um, it, it's funny actually because every payroll program that I've worked on, you will get a challenge with it, and it, it it's not always their fault, and it's not always the business's fault. It all comes back to data. Unfortunately, it's you know, we live in um, organizations where no one knows where the data is, um, and it's easy to blame the third party. But sometimes the negotiation is, well, where is the data before you even kick off the process, right? You know, find the data first and then think about your solution. Yeah. But no, it's a, that's a great story. Thank you. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. We've, got, we've, made a, we've made a connection here. That's, been, that's fantastic. Excellent. Well, look, um, thank you. Uh, incredibly engaging with the questions, actually, which, which is really good because there's nothing worse than, you know, kind of standing up here and you not asking me questions. It, it tells me a couple of things. One, uh, hopefully we've we've landed a message. Hopefully you've got the whole persona thing. That is the the, the big thing. You know, it, it, it is complex, but you can make it simple. But you've got to be prepared prepared to engage with people and not do it one step removed. That that is probably our biggest kind of learning in consulting at the moment. Um, Dominic and Johnny, thank you very much for having me and our team. And I think we've got a theme for the second potential is is on agile. Yeah, so there seemed to be a theme there around Agile. It's another one-hour conversation, but thank you for asking those questions. I just say, no, Johnny, could I ask to wrap up? Yeah. If I could just sort of say thank you for engaging yeah. and entertaining presentations. So we're, we're in a building here, which is innovative, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Flexible learning space. What it also shows us, made me think, is that the way in which it's presented, it, in some ways, in a traditional way, shows that the well-established way of doing things, you shouldn't lose that as well as through change in yeah. some continuity as well. Great analogy. So, thanks. Thank thanks, Dominic. Okay, yeah, I'm thank just you. going to add to, uh, to the thanks, Johnny. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the session um, and to your colleagues as well for, uh, for fielding the questions as well. Um, you know, there's some very um, important messages, I think, come out you know, around having a plan and uh, having a yeah. process, the person-centered approach, obviously, um, and, and communication too. That's a, that was a clearly a, a, a strong message um, and one which we'll, we'll take away. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, as well as it being a learning opportunity, which it definitely has been, it's also a, a relationship building opportunity, which is equally important. Um, and, uh, and I look forward to us exploring other topics and themes yeah. and, uh, and hopefully um, uh, extending a, an opportunity to, uh, to our partners and, and, and businesses locally to come in and take advantage of, of sessions like this as well. So I'm, I'm delighted that you've, uh, you've taken the opportunity to come in. Um, thank you very much to those who have attended um, via the World Wide Web. Um, I hope it's been, uh, um, uh, it's worked well for you. Uh, unfortunately, we can't offer you lunch, but, uh, <laughs> but we'll enjoy it on your behalf, uh, and I, I hope it's worthwhile. Um, thanks to Dominic and to Matt and to, and to the school for, for, for pulling this together. Um, it, it's been very interesting, and, and uh, I, I'd, I'd be delighted to think this was the first of a, of a wee series. That would be great. Um, and, uh, and, and to colleagues for, for, for coming along too. 
Don't forget, um, over lunch, take an opportunity to talk to, uh, to my colleague Stuart or Janet or Peter. I didn't introduce Karen either. If, you were, if you're looking to access some clever students, Karen will help <laughs> you with that as well. So, uh, um, so, so uh, thank you very much for, for, for attending. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, thanks again to Johnny. Uh, lunch will be served out in the foyer as you, uh, as you came in. Um, and we'll look forward to the opportunity there to, to meet more of you personally and to, 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 to continue the discussion with some of your peers. Thanks very Lovely. much. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much.